Today, I'm going to present a lower bound for parallel submodular minimization. And this is joint work with Yaron Sanger. So I'd like to begin by discussing the current state of submodular minimization. So the problem of minimizing a submodular function is a fundamental discrete optimization problem and generalizes many important problems such as min cut, and it has many applications in areas such as computer vision and speech analysis. It is actually known since the early 80s that the problem can be solved exactly in polynomial time using the ellipsoid algorithm. However, the ellipsoid algorithm is very slow in practice and requires many queries to the objective function. So this has motivated a very long line of work. A lot of it is very recent to try to accelerate um, some modular minimization. And in particular, um, the best known query complexity up to date to minimize the submodular function in the general setting is n cube. So a natural way to accelerate the modular minimization is via par parallelization. And all of the previous results in the recent line of work on accelerating for minimization study the query complexity. So they are in a purely sequential setting. So one might wonder if we can uh, further accelerate uh, some modular minimization by using parallelization. So how do we measure parallelization? So for this, there is the adaptive complexity model that was recently introduced in the context of some modular maximization. So the traditional measure of the efficiency of an algorithm is by measuring the total number of queries to the objective function. And this model is a simple model that allows to perform multiple function evaluations in parallel. So we say an algorithm is R adaptive if it consists of R sequential rounds, where in each round, the algorithm may perform fully many function evaluations. So this is a simple measure for the parallelization of an algorithm. So to see that, we can imagine that we have multiple CPUs. And in each round, the CPUs each perform a function evaluation in parallel. So this is an information theoretic measure for the parallel runtime uh, of an algorithm for black box optimization. This is just in terms of the function evaluation and abstracts out lower, lower order details needed uh, for, uh, for a parallel implementation. So the adaptivity of algorithm has been very well studied in two closely related fields uh, in some modular maximization and convex optimization. So now I will discuss the re adaptivity results in these two fields. So first in some modular maximization. So um, unlike some modular minimization, um, some modular maximization can be solved exactly. However, it is known since the 70s that for the canonical problem of maximizing a monotone submodular function under kinetic constraints, there exists a constant one minus one over e algorithm, which is a simple, a simple greedy algorithm um, for submodular maximization. And we also know that it's actually the optimal approximation achievable in polynomial time. However, greedy is highly sequential. It requires linear adaptivity. And actually, until very recently, all of the algorithms that were known for some modular maximization all had linear adaptivity. So there's a recent result that shows that we can actually obtain a log n adaptive algorithm that obtains a constant factor approximation for some modular maximization. So precisely, this is a log n adaptive algorithm that obtains with high probability an approximation arbitrarily close to one third. So this is an exponential improvement in the adaptivity to the power runtime compared to any known, uh, compared to any previously known constant factor approximation algorithm for some modular maximization. So this means that if we can perform function evaluation in parallel, we can now solve some modular maximization exponentially faster uh, by exploiting parallelization. So, and we also, so it was actually also shown that um, this log n round is up to lower order terms, um, the optimal number of rounds um, if we want to obtain a constant factor approximation. So this log n adaptivity result started a very recent, very long line of work 
on the adaptivity of the modulo maximization. And um, the, there's one result I want to mention, which is um, the most closely related to this work, is that for the problem of unconstrained non-monotonous modulo maximization, it's actually possible to obtain an approximation that's arbitrarily close to one half with constant adaptivity. And we know that for this problem, one half is the optimal approximation achievable. So what about convex minimization? So there's actually an important relationship between convex minimization and submodular minimization. And this is because the problem of submodular minimization can be solved by minimizing a convex relaxation of the submodular function. And this convex relaxation is called the Lovash extension. So for submodular minimization, we cannot get the same exponential speed ups as we got for submodular maximization. For, for convex minimization, we cannot get the same exponential speed ups as we got for summary maximization. There's a result by Nemirovsky from 94 that shows that we cannot get um, a sub-polynomial adaptive algorithm that minimizes n-dimensional convex functions up to accuracy epsilon over the L-infinity ball. So only very recently, uh, this uh, lower bound was improved um, to uh, n to the one half in a very recent paper. And uh, we can also obtain lower bounds for the adaptivity of convex minimization, uh, not only over the L infinity ball, but also over the L2 ball, and more generally over LP spaces. So we have these two related areas um, that are semi-modular maximization and convex optimization. And they have very different results for adaptivity. For similar maximization, we can get exponential speed ups using parallelization, whereas for convex optimization, we cannot, we cannot get algorithm with sub polynomial um, adaptivity. So, for similar optimization, uh, very little is actually known about uh, the adaptivity of similar optimization. The algorithm I mentioned that obtains the n cube uh, query complexity uh, uses at least n square iterations, so it has an activity that is at least n squared. And actually, all of the algorithms that are known for the for some of the minimization all have at least uh, n squared activity. And it is also known that um, if um, there is an algorithm that would have sub, -poly sub polynomial adaptivity then it will have query complexity that is at least close to n squared. So in conclusion, for similar minimization, for the general setting where we allow um, poly n queries per round, all that is known about the number of rounds needed, so the power runtime of similar minimization is that this is somewhere in between 1 and n squared. So I'm now going to present uh, the main results. So our main result is that uh, we initiate the study of uh, adaptivity of the adaptivity of some modular minimization by giving the first uh, non-trivial lower bound for parallel some modular minimization. So we show that there is no algorithm with adaptivity that is smaller than log n over log log n that can solve uh, some modular minimization with constant probability. So this is the lower bound that holds both for deterministic and uh, randomized algorithm. And uh, in addition to being the first lower bound uh, for parallel uh, submodular optimization, it's actually also the first lower bound just for unconstrained submodular optimization in general, for both uh, unconstrained maximization and unconstrained minimization. So um, now I would like to move to presenting uh, some of the main ideas um, in the constructions and of this lower bound in the, in, in the analysis. And for that, I'd like to first consider as a warm up the case of non adaptive algorithms. So, algorithms that are one adaptive. So, the construction in the analysis to show the impossibility result for one adaptive algorithm is significantly simpler than for the log n over log log n results. And it conveys a lot of the important ideas for the lower bound. So I'm going to spend a lot of this talk just um, discussing uh, the construction for this uh, 
case for the lower bound for a single round. So what do we want to do? We want to construct um, a family of function. And surely the family of function is hard um, to minimize. So I'll start by presenting the construction of the family of function. So these functions, um, they're going to depend on the partition on the partition of the elements. And we're going to consider partition that uh, partition the ground set of elements N into three parts of elements. Uh, parts P1, P2, and P3. And what we would like to have is that the part P3 is the optimal solution. So this is uh, the unique set of elements that is going to minimize the sum modular function. And we also want to have that as a second property that the parts P2 and P3 are indistinguishable to the algorithm after one round of query. So after one round of query, the algorithm can tell if an element is in P2 and P3. So these two properties together imply that um, it is impossible to minimize uh, this modular function after one round of queries. Okay, so now let me describe uh, the function. So instead of describing the function in terms of function values, I'm going to describe it in terms of the marginal contributions of elements. So the marginal contribution of an element A to a set S is the change of value of the function when I add the element A to the set S. And I'm going to describe uh, the function in terms of these marginal contributions because it's um, significantly simpler to describe it uh, this way compared to uh, the function values. So let's look at uh, the marginal contribution of an element A to a set S for elements that are in P2 and P3. So remember that um, P3, we want P3 to be the optimal solution. And we want elements in P2 and P3 to be indistinguishable. So let's first consider the case uh, where we don't have any elements uh, from P1 in the set S. So if we, if we ignore elements from P1, then we have that um, if the set S contains a small number of elements from P2, then the marginal contribution of an element from P2 to the set S is going to be one and zero otherwise. And it's going to be similar for elements in P3, except that if the set S contains a large number of elements from P3, then we have that the contribution of, an ele of the element A to the set S is going to be negative one. So here already we can see that um, the optimal solution is the set P3, and that we don't want to add uh, elements from C2 to the optimal solution. So now what we want to have is that the elements from P2 and P3 are indistinguishable. And to do that, we're going to use the element in P1 to mask the differences between elements in P2 and P3. So how we're going to do that is that if we have a large number of elements in P1 in our set S, then the elements in P2 and P3 will have the same marginal contribution to the set S. So they will be negative one in both cases. So here I describe to you the cases where we have either zero elements from P1 or a large number of elements from P1. So in general, we're going to use what we call a masking function to consider the general case uh, of how many elements from P1 we have. And so this masking function basically has a value zero if we have zero elements on P1, and has value one if we have at least root of n elements on P1, and linearly interpolate between these two cases. And so then by using this masking function, we get these one contributions for elements in P2 and P3. And we can see that if we have either zero elements on P1 or at least root of n elements on P1, then we recover the marginal contributions from the previous slide. So these are the marginal contributions of elements in P2 and P3 to our function. So if you want to see the full um, definition of the function, so the, the value for each uh, set according to this function, this is the value of a set S. So again, as you can see, um, this is significantly more complicated than the marginal contributions. So we will focus on the looking at the marginal contributions for the analysis. 
Okay, so this was the construction. Now I'd like to discuss the analysis. So as I previously mentioned, there are two properties that we want to show for this elongated function. We want P3 to be the optimal solution, and we want the elements from P2 and P3 to be indistinguishable after one round of queries. And the second property is really going to be the main lemma. So it's going to be the main uh, lemma we're going to discuss for the analysis. Okay. So um, how do we go about showing that um, elements in P2 and P3 are indistinguishable after one one of queries? For this talk, I'm just going to show that um, for like a random partition, they have the same uh, elements in P2 and P3 have the same marginal contribution to a set S that is queried. So for the full proof, there are many more details, but that will convey the main ideas of why these elements are indistinguishable. And here, I wrote again the marginal contribution element in P2 and P3, just so it's easier to follow the proof. So there are two cases. In the first case, uh, the set S that is queries is a small set of elements. So um, if, the, if, there is a, if the set is small, then we will have a small number of elements uh, in that set from P2 and from P3. And then if we look at the definition of the model contribution, uh, we see that the model contribution is this, of the elements in P2 and P3 is this first line. And so we have that the elements, uh, the contribution of elements in P2 and P3 is one minus two times the elastic function. And this is the same marginal contribution for elements in P2 and P3, so they are indistinguishable in that case. So now the second case is when uh, the set S that is queried is large. So if S is large, then uh, we can apply a concentration bound to get our high probability uh, we will have a large number of elements in P1, which are the masking elements, so at least square root of n. So now if we have at least square root of n masking elements, the masking function will have value 1. And now if we plug in at the masking function with value 1, we can see that in our cases, we will have the emotional contributions that have value negative 1. So here again, we get that the emotional contributions of elements in P2 and P3 are equal. So if we combine these two cases, we basically see that with high probability over query S, we're going to have that the marginal contributions of elements in P2 and P3 are equal. So they are, so in some sense, these elements are indistinguishable. Okay, so for, to complete this proof, um, we need two more lemmas. So the first is that we also need to show that if these elements are indistinguishable, then the solution that we reach that is the algorithm is going to be different than P3 with high probability. And of course, uh, we also need to show that this family of function is a family of some modular function. And then when we combine these three lemmas together, we get that there's no one additive algorithm uh, for solving some modular minimization with constant probability. So that was the case, uh, the possibility result for one adaptive algorithm, so with one round of queries. And so the main technical difficulty to obtain the uh, main result is actually to extend uh, this construction for one round of queries to multiple rounds of queries. And now I'd like to discuss a few main ideas that go into um, extending this construction to multiple rounds of queries. So for the partition of elements, uh, now, instead of having three parts, if we want to show a lower bound for R parts, we're going to have R plus two. For, if we want to show a lower bound for R rounds of query, we're going to have R plus two parts. And it's going to be such that um, part R plus two is the optimal solution. And what we're going to want to show is that after I rounds of queries, all the elements that are in PY plus one up to PR plus two are indistinguishable. So what it's saying is that we have R plus two um, different parts, and at each round, uh, the algorithm can learn at most one part. 
So after our parts, there will still remain these two last parts that will be indistinguishable, and that would be why we cannot optimize this, why we cannot minimize this some other function. So again, in this case, the main lemma is going to be that we're going to want to have um, some other function such that the elements so that we have this indistinguishability. So in this case, indistinguishability again is that element in pi plus one through pr plus two are uh, indistinguishable after i rounds of queries. So now, what's the main difficulty um, to obtain uh, such a construction? So what we want is similar, similarly as for the construction for one round of queries, we want that after one round of queries, we want elements in P2 and P3 to be indistinguishable. But then in the second round, where we might have, where the algorithm have already learned the P1, we want elements from P3 to PR to be indistinguishable. So then we will want to have P2 that plays this role of kind of like that masks the differences between elements in P3 to PR. And then similarly, in the third round, we're going to want P3 to mask the differences between elements in, uh, from P4 to PR. And so now we, ha we have this, um, this difficulty where what we need to do is we have, uh, in the first round, for example, we have to mask elements from P2 and P3, which these same elements will then have to mask other elements. So how do we mask differences of elements that then have to mask other elements? So that's the main difficulty in the construction. Okay, so to conclude, um, we initiated the study of the adaptivity, so the power runtime of thermal minimization, and we gave the first lower bound for the power runtime of thermal minimization. Thank you.